Welcome to chapter 41, Community Ecology. Uh, so really for a community, just to make sure you're comfortable with what this means, a community is going to be a series of populations of different species all together. So it's basically all of the biotic or living stuff that's in an area at the same time. So a population is going to be kind of everybody that can interbreed that's in one area at one time. So the same species with a community, it's going to be all the species. Now, if you go up another step, you can get to ecology, which includes not just the biotic, the living stuff, but the abiotic. So this one's trying to focus on here all the various different biotic components. And you can also see as we kind of food web this out, we can kind of map how they interact with each other. You know, it's already difficult enough to figure out how living things interact with each other, let alone to try to throw in a lot of the abiotic stuff. That just can quickly become overwhelming. So with this, we've got our community structure, and there's two basic ways we try to look at this. The first way is going to be species richness, and this one's the more simplistic way, where we say, I'm going to go measure things, and I'm going to do it by just counting how many species are present. So you can see on the chart here, that's basically what they do. Around the tropics, you typically see the uh, increase in the species richness. You'll also see that if there's a lot of rainfall or moisture, that tends to also kind of bump up a little bit the species richness. Now the problem with this is if we're looking at richness, this isn't really telling us is this a balanced ecosystem that has a lot of different species that all have many different individuals, so they're all stable, or is this something where I've got a ton of one species and just a smattering of a bunch of others, but they're all kind of vulnerable to extinction, genetic drift, all these problems that we can experience. And so species diversity tries to rectify this. So it doesn't just look at the number of species, it also goes through and looks at the relative abundance. So of the total number of organisms that are in this area, how well represented is each species? And so this one would kind of sort out the difference between an area that has a lot of different species, but one species or a couple species dominate versus an area that has a lot of different species and most of them are represented by a pretty good number of individuals. That's much more stable, so species diversity would be able to deal with that because it has this relative abundance piece, not just number. Now, the community hypothesis tries to look at why do we find the organisms that we do in each community? You know, how is it that these communities end up finally being situated with all the different species and populations that they do? And there's two ways of looking at this that we'll at least discuss. The individualistic says, all right, we're going to focus on the actual individual species and look at their needs. And so we're going to say that there's going to be some chance in here, you know, whether or not they arrive at the area, whether or not they arrive at the right time to be successful, you know, in terms of their food being present, etc. So there's a bit of chance, but it's going to focus a lot too on are the abiotic conditions right? So is the right amount of moisture? Is it the right temperature? It's going to focus on physically, if we kind of ignore all the other life that's there in large part, would this organism be able to live in this environment? And that's largely what they would say determines who we find there. Now the interactive way of approaching this hypothesis is to say, I'm going to focus on the living things that are there. So I think it's more important who else is already there as to who's going to live there, not just what is the temperature, you know, what is the amount of precipitation, that that's not as big of a deal. And so you'd focus more like, is your prey species there, you know, the one that you prefer the most? Uh, is this predator that's there that's really good at killing you, maybe is he not there? Because if he is there, they might say, I probably won't find you, because that predator would likely either scare you off or wipe you out. And so they focus a lot on the actual biotic. Now in reality, you're probably going to see, depending on the environment, you might get a mix of both of these because you do obviously have to have the right abiotic conditions or you die or be stressed all the time. And you do at some point need the right biotic conditions or else you wouldn't necessarily be able to eat. I mean, you would potentially be hunted to extinction. So ultimately, probably somewhere in between here, favoring one or more depending on the particular uh, species you're looking at and the particular environment. Uh, but it's probably going to be kind of a mix when we actually look at what happens in real life. Now, interactions between organisms, we're first going to look at the idea of interspecifics. So that's between species. So we're looking at, like our lovely little friend here, an otter, and stuff like the clams that he will break apart and feed upon. And so there's going to be two basic types that we'll discuss, one a lot more later, competition. Uh, but you have predation, where I just kind of go around and I typically kill and eat something. Pretty simplistic. 
you know, we interacted. I went through and I killed the deer and then I ate it. We certainly did have a little bit of intermingling there, uh, but it's pretty quick, it's pretty brutal, and it's pretty much over. Whereas competition is going to be a little bit more prolonged, and so this will be where organisms are fighting over resources. And so it could be that the rabbits are trying to catch a particular type of plant, and so are the deer. And so both the rabbits and the deer are trying to manage to get as much of that plant as they can at the same time. So they're competing over a resource. It could be fighting over dens. It could be fighting over holes in the trees to make a nest. Any of these things can lead to competition between species. Now there is one thing here that I've written down that I haven't addressed, and that's this idea of a keystone predator. I know a lot of people think like, oh, there's going to be this big predator now. A bear moves in, wolves move in, otters move into a lake or a pond. And they can start thinking this is going to be terrible because they're going to start eating all kinds of stuff. And so that's going to ultimately perhaps make things go extinct or at least diminish their numbers to where it might cause uh, uh, horrible things that, you know, collapse uh, or at least the brink of collapse for the species that are prey species. But oftentimes what happens is specific predators manage to eat many of the prey species that otherwise start to reproduce out of control and kind of take over. And so if you remove the keystone predator, like this otter, you have invertebrates start to reproduce and start to overpopulate, which then damages the plant species that they feed upon, and it damages other guys that they start to outcompete that would be herbivores, if you will, uh, or perhaps even like, you know, small um, carnivores or omnivores. And so with these keystone predators present, they keep some of those other more base of the food chain type guys, they keep them in check, which allows for a lot more biodiversity. Whereas if they disappear, that allows for that one lower level guy to take over, and so it actually ruins much of the biodiversity because they outcompete or eat a whole bunch of other organisms, and so they end up going extinct in that area. So keystone predators are commonly really focused on trying to make sure that there are wolves, that there are otters, that there's bears, that there's these bigger predators because they have a positive effect on the ecosystem, not a negative one. Now symbiosis is going to be much more closely living together. So this isn't just like a chance encounter as we fight over a resource or I try to eat you. This is going to be us living more or less day by day together. So parasitism is going to be where one benefits because you're always going to have somebody benefit. I mean, that's, otherwise, why would it happen evolutionarily? Somebody's doing it so they can live. But with parasitism, the host, the other guy, is going to be harmed. And so in this case, you have a daddy long legs, all right? And this has mites that are attached to it. And so they're typically going to drink body fluids. And so those body fluids are an energy cost to the host. You have to replenish those. That takes energy. So you take a hit. Now, most parasites don't want to outright kill their host because they would typically die too or have to find another host. So parasites usually try to still live in a relative balance where they take from the host, but they don't take a ridiculous amount quickly. You know, occasionally they will kill their host, but even then it's usually over a longer period of time. That way they have the most benefit possible. So many organisms have just evolved to live with their parasites and they just kind of pay the fee to the parasites and ultimately it stinks, but nobody dies. Then commensalism is going to be kind of the interesting one where one of them gains but the other individual really isn't affected either way. Uh, so this one might be referred to like whales that have barnacles on them. Assuming the barnacles aren't slowing the whales down or otherwise impeding them in some way, the barnacles really don't affect the whale much. And so assuming the whale's not really helped or hurt, it's just kind of like eh, then that's commensalism. The barnacles get a place to be, they can filter feed as they go along, so the whale's benefiting them, but the whale just really is kind of blah for the whole thing. That's commensalism. And then mutualism's where both parties are going to benefit. So we've got like the clownfish where they will hide amongst the anemones uh, and that provides them with protection and at the same time they can also draw animals in which the anemones can sting to death and eat. Uh, you can get food scraps that get caught. There's a variety of things to where they both can benefit from this relationship where they live together. So mutualism is a pretty common thing that you'll see where many organisms kind of reach this truce that I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine, both of us benefit. You know, this would be like uh, insects and flowers. I'll give you nectar, you pollinate me. Everybody wins. You know, there's no reason to be too upset with this. Uh, you could even argue perhaps even humans and dogs where we'll feed you, but then you provide protection, entertainment, uh, companionship, and so ultimately we both think that we're winning. 
Now, beyond this, we've got a couple things where you might want to not work together, uh, but try to ultimately prevent harm. And so we've got how we deal with predation. So some of the basic ways of dealing with that are A, cryptic coloration, which is basically just camo, camouflage. So you can see this guy here looks like a leaf, lives on branches, pretty good camouflage. So if something comes along, it's not likely to even notice it to think it's a food particle if it's trying to eat insects. It just says that's a leaf. I like insects. I'm not going to eat the leaf. So camouflage or cryptic coloration is one very simple, easy, and effective way. The other way is, especially if you're toxic, you advertise it. You flaunt it. So this is aposematic coloration where you're just like, look at me. I am bright red. I'm neon blue. I got something going on. And for me to have lived being this brightly colored, I'm probably going to kill you if you try to eat me. And so you can see the poison dart frog is going to be all like, check me out. I'm bright red. Uh, you have the coral snake that advertises itself with yellows and reds. It's very toxic. And so many things will just look at these and go, hmm, the fact you're that brightly colored and the fact that you're still alive at this point means I probably should stay away. And if it does see somebody try one, like, you know, Ted over there just ate one and he died, then I'd know I probably shouldn't. And then mimicry is another very useful way where you look like somebody else. Now, there's two types, Batesians, where you're basically a faker. And so this is the milk snake. This is not toxic, but it looks a lot like the coral snake, which is toxic. It does have venom. And so by doing this, a lot of things are just like, eh, I'm not going to risk it because it's that guy that's actually venomous that ultimately looks pretty brightly colored. So we're just going to avoid everybody that has similar bright colors. And so that's Batesian. Mullarians wear multiple things that are both toxic. So you see this like uh, monarch butterflies and deneids both appear to be toxic now that they've analyzed it better. Uh, they store toxins from milkweed. So it's not necessarily going to kill you, but it'll make you throw up. And so they both look a lot like each other. So that way, if you eat one, you won't eat another. So by kind of huddling together in terms of looks, you might eat a monarch, but then you'll avoid both of them. Or maybe the next time this particular young bird eats a deneid, realizes that one is not good for me, so it avoids the monarchs. So together, they suffer fewer losses while still getting the message out that, hey, I either don't taste good, I'm toxic, I'll make you sick, something's going on. And then there is some overlap where you might see this as mimicking a leaf, even though technically it's also cryptic coloration. You know, this one's obviously mimicry, but it's using aposematic coloration in the process of that. So keep in mind that with these terms too, there will be a little bit of leeway in between where some of them are on that spectrum. Uh, it's not always just like you're this or this. In some cases, you can kind of be both. And then if you're plants, you see they normally just have chemicals that make something sick or die, or they'll use physical defenses like thorns. We've discussed before some of the plant defenses. So just a quick reminder, this is their normal way is those secondary compounds that are meant to kind of be nasty uh, or just physically trying to grow in a way that stuff can't mess with you. Now the last slide we're going to cover right now is competition. So I want to go a little bit more in depth. There's several ways that I can compete with someone. The first is going to be interference. This is where ultimately we are directly interacting. So lions and hyenas, they will attack each other. They will kill each other. You know, they will posture with each other to try to be territorial and take over lands. So these guys have direct violent interaction, you know, direct confrontations. So that's interference. You know, you and me, mano a mano. Now, exploitative is common more in like herbivores where I'm not going to go as like a deer and stomp on rabbit skulls and be like, you are done. Uh, what I'm normally going to do is just eat your food. And so by eating your food, you can then starve to death. You could then still die. But I didn't do it by directly harming you. I did it more by indirectly harming you, where I'm essentially eating your food or I'm out competing you for you know a specific location for nests, things like that, versus actually fighting you. All right. So it's more passive aggressive, if you will. And then the competitive exclusion principle is one that was really fleshed out, we'll say, by a scientist named Gauss. Uh, he was a Russian scientist, and he did studies to show that if you have where the role in the environment of two different species overlaps, especially if it does significantly, that typically one is going to be better at exploiting that resource than the other, and it will outcompete the other guy and ultimately make them go extinct, at least in that area. So this is the idea that you're only going to get within a given, we call it a niche, is that role. So for a given resource, we're only going to get one person that's going to use it and kind of come out on top. We're not going to see where they're both like sharing, that that doesn't really happen. That's the idea of exclusion. 
So this is like Highlander style, there's just gonna be one. Okay, so in his experiment, he used Paramecia, that's what I'm showing here, this is the one that actually won. Uh, P caught them, I believe is what it is. And then he also did it with some yeast, where he would grow them in constant conditions and show that one of them would essentially beat out the other one by being more effective at getting resources and accessing them. Now, if he changed the resources, he could make the results change. Because at that point, in different conditions, it might favor a different organism. But in general, if you have a set set of resources and you keep things as they are, one of them will typically at least be a little bit better. And because of that, they'll do a better job at living. And over a, a decent chunk of time, they should be able to drive the other organism to extinction or at least very close to it. So that's competitive exclusion.